Welcome everybody to a great lecture by our instructor in training who will introduce himself to you shortly and tell us a little bit about who he is and where he got um, where he is today and what, why he's passionate about scuba diving. So Ronnie, uh, if you would go ahead and just tell us a little bit about yourself first. Hey everyone, um, Ronnie Ahmed, I know most of you already know me. Um, so I started scuba diving seven and a half years ago <coughs> after I was shot and paralyzed at FC Strozier's library. Um, I met Gabrielle in the ICU. Uh, she knew I was an Eagle Scout and knew I liked being outdoors. So she asked if I wanted to get scuba certified. Um, I said, sure, but you know, I didn't, I didn't quite understand how I was gonna do that. Uh, so she, you know, she gave me her number. She told me, call me when you're out of rehab. So that's what I did, got out of rehab, called her. Um, initially got certified as a HSA diver. Um, so that would be where we had an assistance with me at all times um, for safety. And after a few classes of that, um, I'm pretty sure Gabrielle realized pretty quick that I'd been around water my whole life. Uh, my mom always loved the beach. I grew up next to a state park. Uh, you know, being in the Boy Scouts, I spent a lot of time um, camping and stuff like that. Uh, so I've always enjoyed being in the water. I love marine biology. Um, so I felt like it took it to it pretty easily. Um, and we decided to get me certified in SEI. Then we added me to the Dive Masters Institute and, uh, you know, finish up my assistant instructor recently and now finishing instructor. Uh, so, you know, some of the reasons that scuba has been so important to me, um, you know, obviously the, the physical activity is great, but, you know, I have a lot of scar tissue, nerve damage, um, but also just like, uh, social difficulties as well from being in the wheelchair and whatnot. Um, you know, I was paralyzed when I was 21, so, um, somewhat atypical, uh, experience. Um, so having a, a little scoop of family has always been, been really great. Um, gave me a lot of sense of purpose and, um, very for sure to, to be able to teach and, you know, just a transfer of knowledge of, of everything that I know to, to people that I know actually, um, you know, care about my well-being and, and, and everything. So it's been a great journey. Thanks, Ronnie. And let me just um, tell anyone who doesn't know this, that you are groundbreaking here. Um, as Ronnie mentioned, he started out with Handicap Scuba Association, which um, Roberto is an HSA student of, of ours right now. Um, but Ronnie started out with that. And what that means is essentially you do need to have assistance. It's more than just buddies. You need to have assistance when you, when you dive due to the nature of your disability. Um, but Ronnie very quickly showed that he was able to do more and to be more. And so I suggested, let's see about switching your certifications you know, to Scuba Educators International, which used to be YMCA. In 2008, it, it changed to SEI. Um, and I love SEI because they have the highest standards in the industry. And, um, you know, I just thought that it would be great. So I talked to the head of SEI about Ronnie's situation and what his capabilities were physically. And um, he basically said, yes, let's do this. Uh, just modify a couple of the skills. And if, as long as he can perform everything else, we're good. And for Ronnie, the biggest challenges have been you know, getting in and out of the water. When he dives, he's awesome. He's an awesome diver. Everyone who's dived with him knows what an excellent diver he is. And he has wonderful leadership abilities. So he broke ground as the very first dive master um, with paralysis with Scuba Educators International. He then broke ground as the first assistant instructor um, with paraplegia with SEI. And now he is about to become the very first instructor um, with SEI, with paraplegia. So this is a huge deal. Ronnie, what does this mean to you that you're breaking barriers and opening doors for other people? Um, honestly, I, I don't know if I fully understand it um, because it's, it's a lot of stuff that I don't get to see, honestly. Um, I don't know, it's, it's very difficult to be employed when you're differently abled. So 
having something that not only not only having a job but like having a fulfilling one is like a very it's been a hard fought uh journey um with where i didn't didn't know i was going to be for a long time um and i never would have guessed that i'd be you know a scuba instructor uh, so it's been it's been cool thank you and um yeah it, it is cool and i like that you used a term that i use often which is differently abled rather than disabled, um, differently abled is all it is. It's just, there are certain things that you need to do differently. Um, you're fully capable of everything else. Dis almost implies not like less than, and you're not less than, um, what do you love most about diving? What, what, what is, what are some things that everyone should know about how you feel about scuba diving? Um, I think the biggest thing for me is the connection to nature. Um, I mean, it was the reason I joined Boy Scouts. It's the reason I you know, switched over to marine biology. Um, and also if you just talk to me, it's kind of just what I generally gravitate towards. Um, it's what I care the most about, you know, even when it comes to my pets and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, like that night dive was really cool that we did in Boynton, um, you know, that were also drift dives and just seeing, um, just the connection of everything. Uh, Cause I think as humans, we have a propensity to think that we're different or higher than the rest of the world or the, the environment and, and nature. Um, and I think it really shows how closely connected and how important we are to one another. That's great. And uh, for anyone who's just joining in, we are going to get started here shortly. I'm just asking Ronnie a couple of questions before we begin. Ronnie, I know pain is a big part of your condition. Um, and so how does diving help your pain? Uh, diving's the only time I'm not in pain. Uh, you know, from back pain, stomach, GI problems, scar tissue, nerve damage. Uh, it's, there are times where I honestly don't even want to get to the dive site, but I know once I'm there, well, as soon as I get into the water, I'll be fine. Um, it's just kind of like you said, everything up to that point is a little more difficult than normal. And, and if you would just look at the camera, I know you have two monitors set up, but tell us um, a little bit more about what you love about being in the scuba industry, working with people. I'm a, I'm a people person. Um, I've always enjoyed talking with people, uh, even when I wasn't very good at it. So having a reason to interact with people and teach people and help people, um, you know, I've always liked helping people. You know, it's why I donate my blood. I donate my hair. Um, I volunteer, um, you know, try to be as helpful as I can to the people around me, especially the people that are important to me. Um, but uh, sorry, I forgot what the, the question was. It's quite all right. I asked you what was what were your, some of your favorite things about working with people, including our students. I think seeing people get over their fears is the coolest part. Mm -hmm. um, there are some students who have dealt with very difficult situations involving, um, you know, the water, but also just um, mental spaces and stuff like that. So, you know how being there and actually, you know, sometimes physically helping these people um, through their trauma and stuff like that is uh, very rewarding, especially when it comes to like children and stuff like that. What do you see as your future in the scuba industry? Um, I guess mostly just being an educator uh, because that's kind of what I find most fulfilling is the educational side of it. So mostly just educating, obviously you know, educating myself as well. Um, I'd like to, you know, get more certifications and, um, you know, get some specialty courses and whatnot, but taking it one day at a time. So um, I guess, you know, become a better diver myself and, and help other people become a better diver. Excellent. 
Well, we're going to get started and just for everyone's here in just like two more minutes, your mother just called me during that. I did, there was a little glitch and it was your mother probably asking for the Zoom link that she didn't see. Um, so she might hop on as well. But um, one last thing before we get started with your presentation, um, any advice that you would give people considering wanting to learn to scuba dive, whether they have a condition that may limit them or not? Um, any advice that you would give them? Uh, my main advice would just be to, to go out and, and try your best because especially with this group, there's a lot of people that are willing to, to help stick the neck out for you, um, do everything they can to see you succeed. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of places are not like that. Um, so I've always really appreciated that about our group. Um, when, you know, I haven't had consistent caregivers and stuff like that, I can rely on scuba friends to, to help get me suited up and to the dive site safely. Um, so yeah, practice, 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 just like anything else. Awesome. All right. Well, Ronnie, how are you feeling? I uh, feel good. Good, good. Well, why don't we go ahead then and get you started. And I am having a couple people saying they're having a hard time getting in. So I'm just going to copy the link and send that to them. I have made some of the rest of you leadership team um, co-hosts. So if you would um, admit people as they arrive um, for me, if you don't mind helping with that. And Ronnie, the clock will begin as soon as you say hello and begin your presentation. And again, you have 30 minutes. Okay. Um, I can't see my timer, unfortunately, um, but find, yeah, find a way to find a way to, ha uh, to know the time. Okay. Okay. Um, like your, your phone, maybe just have your phone. Yeah. There. I might have to do that. But, uh, but turn your phone, make, if you have any sound on it, turn it off. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so how this is going to work is Ronnie is going to have 30 minutes to give his presentation. And then we'll have 15 minutes for questions and answers at the end. It looks like both your mother and sister are going to be joining during the presentation, just so you know. Okay. Okay. So, hey everyone, I'm Ronnie Ahmed. I'm doing a, a presentation on the impact of pollution on aquatic organisms. So I'm gonna be focusing on the first three sets of pollution. Um, so I'll save that information for later, uh, but to give you some little bits of information about the other uh, types of pollution. Uh, thermal pollution, you'll see that with manatees. They like to swim upriver towards power plant um, exhaust to get the warm water that comes off of them. Um, so you'll see them coming out of ocean waters earlier than normal to be near power plants. Um, noise pollution, even though cars produce 90% uh, of all unwanted noise worldwide, um, there's this thing called the lumbar vocal response where animals produce louder and longer calls um, because of the noise pollution that humans release. And then the vibrations have been found to damage the cilia hairs on jellies. Um, and then magnetic is believed to be used with navigation and stuff like that. So where you think that we're messing with the navigational skills of these animals. Um, and then two things that are uh, not often talked about are space debris and then uh, invasive species is also another version of pollution that is obviously very harmful to aquatic resources. So one of the main things that I really want to harp on for my presentation is um, global warming. So in the uh, past few centuries, global warming has been increasing at an exponential uh, rate. So essentially what the, what's happening is the greenhouse gas uh, effect. So greenhouse gases are things like um, water vapor, uh, methane, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, um, all of those carbon gases, um, as well as nitrous gases as well. Um, and what happens is that the heat is absorbed by the compounds and by the chemical bonds and re-radiated back into the atmosphere, back to um, the planet. So as the ocean warms, uh, it causes a lot of different problems, um, including to things like corals, uh, which are temperature sensitive. So some of the main producers of CO2, um, even though it might not be the most uh, harmful molecule, molecule for molecule, uh, it is 
produce the most um, out of any of the uh, greenhouse gases. So even though America is only 5% of the population, the global population, we produce 25% of the CO2 and 30% of the world's waste. Uh, in 2007, China overtook China uh, overtook the United States as the world's largest producer of CO2, ranking 40th per capita, with America ranking 16th per capita. The largest emitter is Qatar, with 38 tons per capita. And then 100 companies have been the source of more than 70% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. Exxon Mobil, Shell, BP, Chevron, um, and Chevron are identified as among the highest emitting investor-owned companies since 1988. Over 75% of the spills occur within the first three years of a well's life. The cause of the spills can vary widely from equipment failure that manifests in tanks overflow due to corrosion, human error, and lightning strikes. Many of the flow leaks were due to corrosion or being punctured by equipment. Most spills result from routine operations such as cargo loading, discharging cargo, and taking on fuel. And then 91% of the operational spills are small, resulting in less than seven metric tons per spill while uh, spills resulting from accidents, collisions, groundings, hull failures, and explosions are much larger, with 84% involving losses over 700 metric tons. So one of the things that happens along with global warming is ocean acidification. So what you can see up top is you have calcium carbonate shells. So the calcium is made up, um, so as the oceans become more acidic, the uh, calcium in these shells become uh, more dissolvable and will start coming out of the shell. So you can see as the shell goes to the right, it is going into more acidic conditions and um, is actually being dissolved by the acidic water. So the way that this works is that the CO2 in the atmosphere gets absorbed into the water, which then uh, combines into carbonic acid and then can dissociate into a hyd uh, hydrogen ion and uh, bicarbonate ion which are both um, highly acidic. Also why this matters is because there's also bicarbonate stores within our um, rocks and stuff like that, as well as the shells of marine organisms. So as you release the uh, these, um, carbon dioxide from the rocks and from the shells, you actually provide a positive feedback loop that increases global warming as well. So some issues with air pollution. You have ozone pollution, which can cause respiratory disease, cardiovascular disease, throat inflammation, chest pain, and congestion. Smog and haze can reduce the amount of sunlight received by plants to carry out photosynthesis and leads to production of tropospheric oxygen, which damages plants and animals. And then sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides can cause acidic rain, which lowers the pH value of soils and waters as well. And all of these are going to reduce biodiversity which is very important to the health of all of these ecosystems. So some pollution control devices that we have. We have the Clean Air Act of 1963. Thermal oxidizers, which are used to just heat um, exhausts into non-harmful chemicals. Dust collectors, scrubbers, vapory recovery. And then thanks to some of these acts, we have tariff, carbon taxes, cap and trade systems, um, to regulate the uh, industries and whatnot. And then a couple other things, we also have healthy plant and plankton growth. This also goes back into biodiversity. The more things that you have to help take care of the health of the ecosystem, the more tolerant the ecosystem is going to be to change. And then finally, we have the Paris Agreement, which is um, very large for, or very important for emission data and stuff like that. So some issues with cheating emissions that we've had. So we have uh, VW slash BMW cars. The EPA found that many VW cars were being sold in America had defeat softwares and diesel engines that could detect when they were being tested, changing their performance accordingly to improve results. The engines emitted nitrogen oxide pollutants up to four, uh, 40 times above what is allowed in the US. Then oil and gas industries emit 60% more than what is estimated by the EPA. Significantly, researchers found that most emissions came from leaks, equipment failures, and other abnormal operating conditions. The climate impact of these leaks in 2015 was roughly the same as the climate impact of carbon dioxide emissions from all U.S. coal-fired power plants operating in 2015. And then finally, this one's a little bit different than the previous two. So we have cargo ships. So more than $12 billion have been spent on devices known as open-loop scrubbers, which extract sulfur from exhaust fumes of ships that run on heavy fuel and crude oil. 
The sulfur emitted by the ships is rerouted from the exhaust and expelled into the water around the ships, which greatly increases the volume of pollutants and increases carbon dioxide emissions. A total of about 4,000 ships have already had scrubbers installed, according to the world's largest ship classification company. Heavy metal pollution has been connected to damage uh, to central nervous systems in humans uh, and animals, while polyaromatic hydrocarbons, um, sorry, pop up happened, uh, have been blamed for skin, lung, bladder, and liver, uh, liver and stomach cancers. Okay, so up next we have soil and water contaminants. So one of the major ones that people are going to think of is hydrocarbons. Um, and also there's going to be a lot of overlap in uh, from these different uh, categories. So uh, persistent organic pollutants, a lot of these are released from the mining and extraction of hydrocarbons, um, especially benzene and um, phenols and stuff like that. So then you have radioactive contamination um, called norms, which are also released um, just from regular manufacturing, uh, mining and fracking. So mining and fracking of heavy metals obviously are very harmful to the environment, especially when they leach um, from their origin source. Fertilizers, um, all of these are used in biological processes uh, from ATP production to um, different uh, organic compounds, hormones. Uh, these are very important chemicals for a lot of reasons. So when you add excess amounts of these to an environment, it uh, creates a lot of problems that we'll be going into. And then finally, um, I won't be listing all of these, but essentially different pesticides. So I listed them um, kind of in the most common order. Um, some of these I hadn't even heard of before, actually, uh, before uh, doing this research. Uh, but something to note is 80% of pesticides are herbicides, while 80% of herbicides are um, glyphosate uh, pesticides, which are Roundup, essentially. Um, so the majority are from one company, one chemical, as a matter of fact. And also another thing to keep in mind is um, copper, a common uh, industrial pollutant can interfere with the life history development of coral polyps, um, which obviously uh, is very important to a lot of biodiversity. Um, and then the chemical in um, sunblock, oxybenzone, uh, can turn into a light activated toxin, um, all of which is harmful to coral development. So again, the biggest thing that, or the easiest thing to talk about is uh, oil spills, um, especially being from Florida. I know pretty much everyone here knows about the Deep Horizon uh, oil spill. This is an actual picture from that incident. Um, so obviously there are a lot of environmental impacts that come from these oil spills. So the oil permeates the structure of the plumage of birds and the fur of animals, reducing their insulating ability uh, making them more vulnerable to temper temperature fluctuations and less buoyant in the water. As they preen, they ingest the oil coating, irritating the digestive tract, altering liver and lung function, and causing kidney damage. Together with their diminished foraging capacity, this can rapidly result in dehydration and metabolic imbalance. Oil can also blind an animal, leaving it defenseless. Some animals exposed to petroleum also experience changes in their hormonal balance, including changes in their luteinizing protein. Some studies have suggested that less than 1% of oil-soaked animals survive even after cleaning. Oil spills also harm air quality. The chemicals in crude oils, mostly hydrocarbons um, that contain toxic chemicals such as benzenes, toluenes, and aromatic hydrocarbons, um, those POPs I was mentioning before. They also kill shellfish, reptiles, and other organisms that they coat. So dispersants are sometimes used, which is a colloid used to improve the separation of particles and to prevent settling and clumping. They may rapidly disperse large amounts of certain types of oils um, from the sea surface by transferring it into the water column. They will cause the oil slick to break up and form water-soluble micelles, which are then rapidly diluted. The oil is effectively spread throughout a larger volume of water. Our laboratory experiments have showed that dispersants increase toxic hydrocarbon levels in fish by a factor of up to 100 and may kill fish eggs. Um, dispersed oil droplets infiltrate into deep water and can lethally contaminate coral. A 2012 study found that Corexit dispersant had increased the toxicity of oil by 52 times. Cleanup and recovery from an oil spill is difficult and depends on many factors, including the type of oil spill, the temperature of the water, and the types of shorelines and beaches involved. There are currently no efforts to cap many leaking oil heads, and oil spills at sea are generally much more damaging than those on land, since, uh, since they can spread for hundreds of nautical miles and cover beaches. 
Dolphins and other species in the Gulf are still suffering the lingering destructive effects of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in 2010. Records show that fracking have been uh, on the rise in the Gulf of Mexico and the EPA has failed to conduct any meaningful review on environmental impacts of dumping fracking waste um, while they spend uh, 10 times as much on education. So we don't really do much to prevent these things from happening. So furthermore into soil pollution. So we have toxins may pass through trophic levels becoming uh, exponentially more concentrated called biomagnification. This is why the FDA has guidelines uh, recommending pregnant women, nursing women and children limit their intake of tuna and other predatory fish. Uh, soil and water become infertile and unsuitable for plants and animals. Obviously this is gonna be bad for biodiversity. This will affect other organisms in the food web and reduce biodiversity um, through uh, trophic cascades and eutrophic zones. So eutrophic cascades are basically how food webs fit together. So when you take away an important species, for example, um, sea otters, when you get rid of the sea otters and they aren't taking care of the herbivores as much and the urchins and things of that nature, they will feed on the kelp and the kelp will not be able to flourish because the um, food web has been disturbed. So that's a trophic cascade that can happen from a disturbed food web. And then eutrophic zones is what I was talking about earlier when it comes to all those nutrients leaching out into um, different places. The biggest one is the Gulf of Mexico as a, the world's largest dead zone. Um, all of it comes from, it starts in the uh, Great Lakes and then funnels down through the Mississippi and all of the sediment and uh, chemicals dumps out into the Gulf. So what happens is all the nutrients go out to the Gulf. There is a bloom of zooplankton. As the zooplankton starts to decay and die off, bacteria will feed on the zooplankton, which absorbs all the oxygen within the surrounding system, choking out any kind of animal life that might be present there, fish, um, crustaceans, anything. Um, most animals need uh, oxygen, obviously. So um, eutrophic zones are a very important thing that we need to address. Um, and in a similar vein, uh, we have the creation of superbugs, bacteria, and viruses. So animals receive uh, antibiotics in their feed and water, uh, which increase, uh, which creates antibiotic resistant bacteria in their gut. These drug resistant bacteria can spread into the environment uh, where chicken farmers and use more than cattle and pig farmers. Children under five are under, at the most danger. Um, there are special dangers uh, as they are smaller and their livers and kidneys are not as proficient at excreting toxins and their nervous systems are still developing. So not only are factory farms known for extreme animal uh, cruelty, but they are also responsible for polluting groundwater, drinking water, and contributing to massive deforestation. They produce 100 times more waste than the entire US population. Runoff from these establishments contribute to dead zones like in the Gulf of Mexico, water pollution, resistant rootworms, superweeds, and environmental devastation. These agrochemical giants threaten the availability and uh, genetic diversity of seeds and animals that are critical to sustainable food systems and to our availability um, to respond to impacts of climate change. So another man-made issue um, are these giant garbage patches. So the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is the largest garbage patch that we know of. Um, so this is just a, a um, diagram of what it looks like. So 80% of the trash is plastic. Um, with 80% of the plastic coming from the Yangtze, Indus, Yellow, High, Nile, Ganges, Pearl, uh, Pearl Amur, Niger, and Mekong rivers. Garbage patch, uh, cause, the garbage patches cause ecosystems uh, and environmental problems that affect marine life, contaminate oceans with toxic chemicals, and contribute to greenhouse gas emissions. The Great Pacific Garbage Patch has the highest density of marine debris and plastic. The trade in plastic and waste from industrial uh, countries to developing nations or developing countries have been identified as the main cause of marine litter. Plastics uh, photodegrade on exposure to the sun. The waste is not compact, and although most of it is near the surface, it can be found up to 100 feet deep in the water. The patch is believed to increase tenfold each decade since 1945, and is estimated to be twice the size of Texas. The gyre contains approximately six pounds of plastic for every pound of uh, plankton. A 2018 study found that synthetic uh, fishing nets make up nearly half the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, and 20% of the debris comes from the 2011 uh, Japanese tsunami. An estimated uh, 1 million animals are strangled, suffocate, or are injured by plastics every year. Being entangled often results in severe laceration ulcers and can prevent escape 
um, from predators. Ingestion fills their stomach and leaves them to believe they're full when they have nothing of nutritional value and can cause blockage of intestines as well as tearing of interior stomach or intestinal lining, ultimately leading to starvation and death. When ingested, some of these uh, affect animal brain cells similarly to estradiol, causing hormone disruption uh, in the affected wildlife. As an estrogen and glutocorticoid uh, receptor agonist, BPA is interfering with the endocrine system and is associated with an increased fat in rodents. Plasticizers and microplastics have been linked to abnormal growth and reproductive problems in multiple animal models due to endocrine disruption. Equipment such as nets can also drag along seabeds causing damage to coral reefs. Microplastics have been postulated to cause GI irritation, alter, uh, alteration to microbiome, disturbances of energy and lipid metabolism, and oxidative stress. So microplastics can concentrate in the um, gills and intestines of marine life and can interfere with their feeding habits, typically resulting in death. Plastics are produced with toxic chemicals, so these chemical substances enter the food chain, including fish that are some, sometimes eaten by humans. Organic pollutants, such as pesticides, can leach into organisms that ingest microplastics, along with dangerous metals such as lead, mercury, and cadmium. In 2020, a study found that the Atlantic Ocean contains 10 times uh, more plastic than was previously thought. And then some microplastics leave the sea and enter the air. Ingestion of plastics have been associated with a variety of reproductive carcinogenic and mutagenic effects. It's been linked with uh, autoimmune disease and endocrine disrupting agents leading to reduced male fertil fertility and breast cancer. Plastics in the human body can stop slow uh, or slow down detoxifying um, mechanisms causing acute toxicity and lethality. In vitro studies from human cells showed uh, evidence that polystyrene nanoparticles are taken up and can induce oxidative stress and pro-inflammatory responses as well. So some different control devices we have for soil and water pollution. Um, one of the most important ones for our population size is sewage treatment, um, industrial waste water treatment, vapor recovery system, just like before, Phytoremediation, so this is using plants to uh, help fix environmental issues. This is a fairly new study, um, but there have been many studies or several studies that show that certain plants can help uptake uh, harmful chemicals and uh, metabolize them into less harmful things. And then you have the uh, National Environmental Policy of 1969, the Federal Water Pollution Control Act uh, Amendments of 1972, and then the Superfund Act of 1980. Um, and that's actually where the protection of groundwater comes from. You would have thought it was uh, with the Federal Pollution Control Act, uh, but it was actually from the Superfund Act in the 80s. Um, so you have the Safe Drinking Water Act, uh, Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, and the Superfund Act, all which protect groundwater. EPA regulates 94 chemicals in drinking water sources, but does not set standards for many others that could be potentially dangerous. 300 million Americans' waters are affected, with nearly nine in 10 violations subjected to no formal action. The report includes a list of 12 states with most water safety violations based on population, Texas, Florida, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey. Analysis found erroneous data is used to calculate how deep injection wells need to go to avoid drinking water sources. Um, California also found that the state had permitted hundreds of oil and gas extractions of water disposal injection uh, in aquifers that should have been protected under the Safe Water Drinking Act. The so-called Halliburton loopholes allow fracking companies to keep chemicals they uh, use secret from the pu uh, from public eye. So another big issue that we have is lead. So one in five lead batteries uh, from American vehicles end up in Mexican recycling plants to be broken down by workers under conditions that are abysmal. Some are run by cartels who use them to launder money. Some extract the lead to sell locally for use in ammunition or fishing weights. U.S. melters have seen much of their business leave the country since exposure limits for uh, American workers were tightened. Some companies have purchased or built smelters just over the border. Studies have also shown that lead contamination ranges from 40 to 400 times uh, naturally occurring lead levels in the area. Residents say that they suffer chronic headaches, bone pain, and that pets and livestock fail to reproduce or drop dead without warning. By funding research of its own scientists and physicians, the Ethel Corporation effectively shut down uh, arguments about the risks of polluting the air with leaded gasoline emissions. The lead industry fought the regulations with a senior research for the Ethel Corporation, arguing that the studies had shown that automobile lead emissions had no impact on human health. The uh, Ethel Corporation, DuPont, and others then sued the EPA to try to halt the uh, agency from regulating lead and gas. 
1986, uh, California passed the um, first Childhood Lead Poisoning Prevention Act. The state declared childhood lead exposure as the most significant childhood environmental uh, health problem in the state. In 2008, the California Superior Court decision, uh, the state found that 85% of the California um, lead contamination came from the petroleum industry and about 14% of uh, the paint industry. The No Lead in School Water Act is a federal bill to help schools test for and remove lead from their water supply systems by providing funding and setting up standards for state-based lead testing and remediation. The bill did not move forward in Congress, but there are plans to re, uh, reintroduce the legislation again. And then the liners uh, that are used as protective layers between the landfills and the environment can break, uh, leaking toxins and contaminating nearby soil and water. The primary cause of toxicity is the predilection for interfering with the proper functioning of enzymes within our body. It does so by binding to uh, sulfur groups uh, found in many enzymes or mimicking or displacing other metals, which act as cofactors in many enzymatic reactions. The essential metals that lead interacts with include calcium, uh, iron, and zinc. By mimicking calcium, lead can also cross the blood-brain barrier. It damages myelin sheaths of neurons, reducing their numbers, interfering with neurotransmission, and decreases neural growth. Um, symptoms of lead poisoning include um, neuropathy, uh, oh, sorry, I uh, don't know what just happened there. So okay. the symptoms of lead poisoning include neuropathy, colic-like abdominal pains, and possible weakness in the fingers, wrist, or ankles. In pregnant women, high levels of exposure uh, lead to miscarriages, where chronic high-level exposures reduce fertility in males. Early childhood exposures has been linked to uh, risk of sleep disturbances and excess daytime drowsiness in uh, uh, later childhood, with high uh, blood levels are associated with delayed puberty in girls. The uh, fall and exposure to airborne lead from combustion of tetra of lead and gasoline during the 20th century has also been linked to increased um, crime levels. Okay, so then up next we have um, dioxins. So the forest industry directly doused four children with pesticides as they were fishing by a river. The chemical was one of two active ingredients uh, in Agent Orange, which the US military had stopped using in the Vietnam War after public outcry uh, about the fact that it caused cancer, birth defects, and serious harm to people, animals, the, and the environment. Um, I'm sure you guys remember the bald eagles being affected by it, which is a large reason why Americans actually um, cared about it. So immediately after they were sprayed, the Van Strums children developed nosebleeds, bloody diarrhea, and headaches, with many of their neighbors falling sick too. Several women who lived in the area had miscarriages shortly after the incident, and locals described finding animals that had died or had bizarre deformities, including ducks with backwards-facing feet, birds with misshapen beaks, uh, and blinded elk, ca and cats and dogs that began uh, bleeding from their eyes and ears. The Ohio... Um, Ohio Attorney General Mike DeWine sued the agricultural, agricultural giant Monsanto, alleging the company concealed dangers posed by a toxic chemical compound it manufactured for nearly half a century. Monsanto produced nearly all the PCBs, which were used in everything from lubricants to electrical equipment in the United States from the 30s to the 70s. The suit alleges that Monsanto learned of PCBs toxic effects in the 30s, yet kept producing the compound while concealing its effects. The former Monsanto boss, uh, said the government regulatory agencies from which the company used to deal with in the 80s simply depended on data supplied by the company. They did not even have a test tube to validate the data. So these are uh, just kind of like a diagram showing you of the many ways that humans are affected um, by many of the pollutions that I've been talking about. And honestly, not all of them are even on here. Um, but one of the things that I just kind of wanted to remind you of is even um, though this is a human example, our metabolic pathways are very similar. Um, we use the same DNA, we use the same amino acids. Uh, a lot of these processes that you are seeing affected right here are also going to affect animals. Um, if anything, they might affect animals more because um, some of them are, are smaller and the, also bioaccumulation, depending on where they are, the food web, um, there's a lot of variations uh, of, of how it can affect animals as well. So it's important to have proper science and um, studies on where these things are coming from, the forms that they're entering bodies from. Um, and, you know, obviously our first instinct is to look at humans, but we also need to start thinking about how animals and food webs are impacted as well. So what can we do? So it's a little, I don't know what happened here, but it's all right. So 
first thing I'm going to talk about is switching to a vegan or vegetarian diet. So veganism alleviates pressure on scarce lands and water resources, reducing greenhouse gas emissions and help sustainability. The average American man consumes almost twice the amount of uh, protein needed per day. As a result, the US style life uh, diet environmental put footprint is twice that of the world's average. Meat and dairy production account for nearly 85% of the greenhouse gas emission and 90% of the agricultural land use associated with the average American diet. About half of the emissions and land use are from beef alone. Um, so just switching from beef to chicken or pork can significantly reduce emissions and low impact foods tend to be cheaper than high impact foods like proteins uh, like beef and lamb. Um, so furthermore, we should also be testing uh, chemicals for their danger, for, uh, especially towards the government or towards the public, um, regulate chemicals based on uh, their harm to the environment, disclose the amount of chemicals that they use, standardize spill data, phase out toxic chemicals, restore the Clean Water Acts and enforce them, taper pollution levels, uh, close loopholes and have stronger limits on the release of toxic um, chemicals, change manufacturing practices, reduce re use of single plastics, harmonize international laws and organizations, and then coherence of policies and science. So protection um, of government scientists from retaliation and intimidation while making government more transparent, accountable, and reform regulatory processes, strengthen scientific advice to the government, and strengthen uh, monitoring, enforcement, and punishment. So companies are secretive about their emission data and few set hard targets intended to deal with their pollution. So in three, we have pollution and dangerous stability of Earth support systems and threatens the continuing survival of human society. A 2017 study found that 9 million people die annually, 15 times higher than all deaths in human violence. There's also um, links to poor outcomes for children, the increased in violent crimes, especially with lead, and decreased productivity for indoor and outdoor workers. And then finally, we have a bunch of different organizations and citizen science um, organizations that um, are used to clean up in the environment, help take care of ecosystems, um, some of them that you can actually go and volunteer with as well. Um, and a lot of really cool, a lot of these are new um, projects that are, that are coming about. So, you know, fingers crossed that we can actually make some good headway on uh, the pollution problems that we have in the future. And that is it. Thank you, Ronnie. Perfect timing with the 30 minutes. Good job. Yeah. I would like to open it up to question and questions and answers at this time. So who has questions for Ronnie on what he talked about? And, um, and I know some of you joined late as well. I want to give a shout out because you have some fans here who also joined. You have your sister and your mother who are online. And so, and if you would just look at the camera instead of the TV for this part, um, any questions for Ronnie? That was a lot of information. I know you did a lot of research. Um, Ronnie, while we're waiting on other people asking questions, let me ask you, what did you find most surprising in your research? Um, I think how much of it comes from these giant organizations. Uh, there's a lot of articles and a lot of people that talk about what we need to do as citizens. And of course we should, as citizens, reduce the amount of plastic that we use and things of that nature, switch to vegan and vegetarianism is the, the most helpful thing that we can do. Um, but I think regulating the, the corporations, regulating how trash is, uh, is, is transported, um, our, our limits and the loopholes um, of, of extraction of these natural resources. Um, and it was, it was very interesting seeing how linked even these deep sea mining uh, expeditions affect the ecosystem. Yeah, and, and Ronnie, I know when you mentioned the vegetarian and vegan diet, both Bill and I were kind of cheering inside. <laughs> yes, um, but Bill in the chat box, uh, he asked, are there any Superfund sites near here? Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of Superfund sites. I think when I was looking it up there, as far as Superfund sites, I think there's about um, 40,000. And then that's not including brownfield sites and things of that nature, which are, you know, 
uh, I would say kind of like the little little brother versions of the super fun sites. So I'll ask a question um, and I want to preface it with saying that uh, having worked in some fields and like knowing a lot of what you're talking about, like I want to say first and foremost that I am not opposed to regulation at all. Um, I think it's something that we need in some areas and some other areas not. But anyway, so in terms of like regulation and like developing more laws, like kind of what you were saying is that um, those laws really only seem to affect like small people, like the little people, like the communities and, and like the small commercial, like the big organizations and corporations with money always find loopholes to these things. So it kind of is like oftentimes a slap into the uh, face of like the local fishermen. Like when I, I follow like FWC and like the different rules they have, and it's like never about these large commercial fisheries that are doing the majority of like a lot of the damage. So that's like another problem. But in regard to this, like did you ever, did you see anything that was like more so like along the lines of like, we can have all the laws in the world. If like no one's following them, then it doesn't matter. Like, are they doing anything about that? Like trying to get rid of all these loopholes and, and you know, sort of stop allowing big corporations to continue, um, you know, doing the majority of the polluting. Cause you know, we can sit here and we can recycle and we can do all these little things. But at the end of the day, the majority of it is coming from these, big companies. Yeah. So I think kind of like that big list that I had, you know, it, it was a little wordy, but there's a lot of like really important details there, like making honestly the biggest thing. And, and this kind of goes outside of pollution. This kind of goes into the overall issues with politics. I feel right now um, is a lack of information. Uh, statistics are not taken. Studies are not done. Um, thing, th there seems to be like a hesitation of doing anything in, in lieu of getting the right data. Um, so, you know, we, we need to act because these things are very quickly coming to a head. Um, you know, there are many studies that show, you know, kind of like that 2050 timeline of, of being a lot of uh, issues coming about around that time. Um, so yeah, making information publicly available, making spill data um, standardized, uh, you know, getting rid of all of these, because every state is allowed to have different laws for how spills, pollutants, and things are um, recorded and disclosed to the government. So we need to have those closed off. That's kind of like the loopholes that I'm talking about, um, so that we know everything that's happening, everyone's on the same page, and we're able to address the statistics properly. And then the other thing is, um, Gabrielle knows I was just taking this very difficult advanced said strat class. And we talked a lot about like um, the carbon cycle since the beginning of the earth. Um, and so I know that you were talking about um, how like this anthropogenic time period where humans are affecting this um, cycle so much. Like, so looking back at the cycle, it already occurs, right? So nature already does that on its own and it has, you know, negative and positive feedback loops. And when they're positive, it sort of has its own method of like eventually throwing a monkey wrench and turning it negative so that that stops. So right now, like when we're talking about like humans exacerbating this like situation, um, did you read anything about like maybe them putting data that's like, it's not just us, like this is also happening like double, right? So like nature is already doing that on its own. And if you look at like the catastrophic events that like occurred from those systems, if we couple that with like what humans are doing, like it's probably gonna be way worse than any of these mass extinctions that we've had in the past. So did you read anything about that? Cause I, like when you were talking about, it, I was like, oh, I didn't even ever think to look at that myself. <laughs> so. So that's the interesting thing. Um, and that's one of the main arguments that especially the oil and gas industry have been using for a long time of why it's not a big deal. Um, however, when you look at the numbers and the statistics of even historically speaking, uh, there's nothing like what we're seeing. This is so far out of the norm and so far out of what is expected from the natural system. Uh, that from statistically speaking from the 50s on we are 100 percent the main cause of global warming and climate change since the 50s um 
And unfortunately, there's a lot of propaganda and muddying the waters, uh, bullying scientists, um, paying for faulty research and, and things of that nature, uh, all to make a quick buck, unfortunately. Yeah, I guess that's what I'm, I'm kind of saying is that because people be like, oh, well, this was going to happen anyways. Well, like, yes, but not at the rate that it's happening. So like, did you see any type of like information or education that we could spread that's like no one's saying that <laughs> that only this is happening it's like that's happening naturally and then we're like compounding it by like a thousand million percent <laughs> well that's the thing is like there's there really isn't any one article because there there's metadata there's accumulations of thousands of research articles of entire universities organizations, government, like I was reading about this, um, there, there was this uh, article that I put in as like a citation earlier in my presentation that talked about how 1500 scientists, economists, politicians from 120 different countries came together and came up with that uh, number that I was talking about since the 50s, we've been the main cause of uh, climate change and um, and global warming so like it's i anyone that, that i feel like anyone trying to make that argument is kind of like in the the same boat as flat earthers you can sit there and try to have that discussion with with them and you know i applaud you for it but um if you're of that persuasion where you just don't want to look at the science you don't want to look at the statistics uh, i can't make you change your mind you know um so there's there's so many so much research showing that we have been the cause since the 50s and that's with all of these oil companies all these gas industries all of these uh, car companies pushing for leaded gas and oil and pushing electric vehicles away and renewable resources away this is with all the muddying of the water we can still see that since the 50s that this has been a problem caused by people um so i just feel like that's just like a also, well, something to say to say, oh, it's just a natural phenomenon. Look at the stats. It's the numbers are not normal. Just you know, any chart will show you that. Thank you, Ronnie. We have someone who typed in the chat box made note of the fact that um, several power plants um, have output channels from the plants, and that the temperature in those waters, specifically speaking of lakes around North Carolina, but obviously, you know, we have plenty of them all across the nation, um, that the, sig the significance of the temperature difference, 15 to 20 degrees, can be within a quarter mile of the plants. How does that impact the aquatic life, the, the temperature changes around the uh, power plants? So there actually isn't a lot of research going into thermal pollution. That's still a very new one, along with um, noise pollution and electromagnetism. So one of the main ones that people like to talk about is the manatees example. Um, they like to be warm, so they actually go towards the warm water to stay warm um, when it's a little colder out. Um, and you've actually seen, there's a lot of studies showing that manatees have been spending more and more time within the, uh, the river systems because of the exhaust of the, uh, the thermal pollution. Um, but, you know, like I was saying, all animals uh, work within a thermal limit. So, um, you know, Obviously, coral is an easy one to look at and say, oh, look, you know, once you're outside of that thermal limit. But, you know, every being, fish, crustaceans, um, worms, you know, if you make them too hot or too cold, you stop their biological functions. So it's going to be a, a, an issue, especially if you're talking about something as drastic as 15, 20 degrees as opposed to 510. Excellent. Let's, um, Victor's got a question. So it looks like we have just a couple more minutes. Yeah, well, uh... Congratulations, Ronnie. Great, great presentation. And um, it, it was a great journey from the global to, you know, all, all the chemical part of pollution, which was great. But, um, you know, being this lecture towards your instructor certification, I would like you to comment on um, how this relates from the perspective of uh, the scuba industry, how it affects uh, you know, the environment or contributes to water pollution or to, uh, to ocean or aquatic pollution in general and vice versa, how that pollution can affect the uh, scuba industry. 
that, that's one, then I have another very short. So I don't have an exact number, but I know that ecotourism brings in billions of dollars um, to Florida alone. Uh, from the shellfish, seafood, beach life, um, the freshwater systems that we have, they all bring in so much value that I think a lot of people don't understand. Um, you know, there's a reason we have the Everglades, there's a reason we have uh, marine protection uh, agencies and stuff like that in areas to, uh, to protect these important nurseries and these important growing grounds for so many animals. Um, you know, like I was kind of saying at the beginning, we have this tendency to think of ourselves as different and separated from the environment. But um, in the coming years, in the coming decades, we're going to see more and more that we rely on the environment. We rely on these animals. We rely on the bacteria. Um, and there's a lot of conversations I don't think that we are having um, that we're going to need to have in the, the upcoming years especially for, you know, things like scuba, uh, you know, a lot of our focus is on the macro, meso and macro. So things that we can see, things that we can kind of touch, but the system goes much deeper than that. There's microscopic nano uh, organisms. You know, like I said, with the Boynton Beach dive, every single particle in the water is alive. And if that dies, the fish die with it. And everything goes, um, you know, the, the trophic cascade that I was talking about, when you get rid of one, it all starts falling down too. When you get rid of the sharks, everything else falls apart too. You know, that goes for almost every animal, unfortunately, because it's a, it's a food web, not a, not a pyramid or anything like that. Thank you so much. That was a great question, Victor. And Ronnie has another two lectures in two weeks. They're gonna be 15 minute lectures each. He doesn't yet know the topic, but he will be assigned those. He'll have a little less time to prepare for those. Um, but thank you all so much for being here today. If you, if you take one thing away, I would say, please stop using plastic, please stop. There's no need to use plastic water bottles ever, ever. You know, um, there's so many options out there, um, but also consider the use of your garbage, your fertilizer, things like that, that, that are greatly impacting our ecosystem. And so Ronnie, um, thank you for spending so much time researching and preparing for this lecture. And if you'll just look at the camera instead of the monitor for a moment and just um, tell everyone, thank you for being here, Ronnie. So your, your opportunity to just say thank you for being here and supporting you. Yeah, you know, like I said at the beginning, I really appreciated, you know, the Scuba family. Um, you know, it's a large part of the reason that I stayed in Tallahassee, I still, you know, stayed in school was to, to be around all of you guys. Um, you know, you've helped me through some of the, the hardest times of my life. So I uh, just wanted to thank everyone for being here. Thank you so much, Ronnie. Um, let's all give him a round of applause. Unmute yourselves for a moment and just, uh, you know, woohoo or whatever you want to say. Hey, good job. Great job, Ronnie. Uh, hey, Mama, Mama's there. You yeah, unmute yourself. <laughs> Rashida, unmute yourself. She's talking and <laughs> moms, you know, there she is. You can say yeah. something. I love you. I love Ronnie. You guys did an awesome job. Thank you so much. Ronnie, any final Final word before I end. Well, just thanks everyone for being here. You know, I always appreciate the support. Uh, you guys are all super important to me. Uh, love my, my scuba family. Give me something to, to live for. Awesome. And thank you leadership team, especially for being here. Really appreciate you. All right, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, Ronnie. Good job. Bye. Ronnie, Ronnie job, and Victor, Ronnie. if you'll stick around, just stay here, Ronnie and Victor, okay? <laughs>